Welcome to the Drinking horns, a very, very important item in the Norse and just Northern European culture in general. In fact, it's actually a very important part of our native spirituality, even. But it's rarely talked about, actually, um, for a reason. These were very important drinking vessels during pagan times. But when certain cultures became Christian in the north of Europe, they just kind of disappeared and were even made illegal in some places. So in this video, we're speaking about why, going over the sources and archaeological finds on this important item. Before I get started uh, introducing the sponsor of this video, myself, <laughs> as always on my online shop, everything is based on the archaeological finds. We're about to take over the drinking horn industry, guys, because most of what is out there is garbage made in China, stinky, leaks, bad quality, just uh, really weird designs and all kinds of made up things um, that you find on Alibaba. These horns are ethically sourced, coated with oil and conditioner to prevent the kind of gamey smell and taste that every other horn has, or they're coated with resin, just like this interpretation of the horn that Thor drank from his trip to Uthgaith, as I'll speak about in this video. This is just one of the replicas of the archaeological finds uh, from, from written sources, as I'm about to go over right here. So first, check out all these cool names for drinking horns that are attested in Old Norse texts. This is the database of skaldic poetry, and I encourage you all to check it out. It's a very cool website, and what I'm showing here is a list of kennings, which are like poetical metaphors that are attested in Old Norse as referring to drinking horns. Beer, mansion, mead, trench, curved trees of skulls, the spears of bulls, and many other ways to refer to drinking horns. So my personal favorite, Hörge um, the Hörge of the eyebrow. So the Hörge is basically like our Norse pagan altar where the sacrifices and rituals would be taking place. This is the first spiritual element about drinking horns that I'll speak about, but there is a lot more. Also, there's a certain type of drinking horn that we find in the sources that is referred to as a minnis horn. Uh, so a memorial horn that was basically um, used for drinking out of when toasting to the ancestors, for example, like uh, honoring their memory, uh, as I will speak about in this video. Uh, the, the video is not um, about the archaeological finds, um, but I am going to go over a few important points. Um, so drinking horns, they are, you know, uh, not going to be preserved much in the archaeological finds. They are organic material and they decompose very quickly. So we're not going to find these things buried uh, still existing after a thousand years. What we do have, though, is drinking horn terminals and the rims. Um, many of those, uh, like I carry replicas of here, and judging by uh, the existing uh, metal uh, terminals and rims and other parts to it like that, we can tell what the actual size of what the horn would have been. Another interesting point about the archaeology, we find horns that are made from bull, goats and ram's horns, but also the aurochs horn, the extinct species of cattle that we used to have in Europe. Some of them up to twice the size of our modern day cattle. Um, there is a skeleton here about how big they would have been from my trip to the National Museum of uh, Denmark. And don't forget the aurochs actually has a rune too in our alphabet, the elder futaike urus. Of course, that uh, is attached to a deep spiritual symbolism behind it, like every other rune. And of course, we find horns made of other materials like glass and precious metals, plenty of those like you see here. Also, another important point, um, the archaeological excavations usually show drinking horns in pairs. The horns from Sutton Hu, Taplo, Felskere, Birkat, Birka, and many more, they also uh, come in pairs. Uh, of course, it makes sense. The bull has two horns, duh, okay, that makes sense. But also the fact that during ritual or feasting, drinking was something done together as kind of a connecting, bonding thing, as I will speak about in a minute from the written sources. Uh, we also have um, 
not horns in the archaeological finds, but artwork depicting horns, like you see on these rune stones, and other artwork from the Viking Age um, that you see on all these things. Uh, it's almost always a woman holding a drinking horn, like she's uh, serving it. Uh, also, a very important note, drinking horns appear way more often in um, female graves, okay? So this is natural and believed to be for a couple of reasons, possibly... The first reason, it just reflects the role of women um, in the Viking Age and how it was their kind of traditional uh, duty to serve drinks to the incoming guests, um, as scholars such as Michael Enright have uh, suggested. Uh, but possibly it's much more spiritual and a deeper meaning than this, reflecting some long-lost sacred rituals of initiation where the maiden would serve a uh, drink to the initiates, just like Maria Kvilherug spoke about in uh, her book, um, The Maiden and the Mead. Everyone should give that a read, and as usual, the sources will all be below in the description. Either way, the fact um, that more drinking horns are, are um, in, much more often in female graves in the Viking Age, it reflects, of course, the kind of duty they had in life, serving drinks for whatever purpose that may be, or... Even more importantly, serving drinks in the afterlife, as the written sources suggest, uh, also that I'm about to cover. Um, so burying it with them, so it would be a means of them taking it to the afterlife. Final fun note, um, drinking horns also seem to have disappeared completely around the late Viking Age. They were outlawed and actually dismissed as being a pagan, sinful thing. So they disappear out of use for a few hundred years. And then they make a comeback in about the 1400s, but these were made from other things like precious metals and they were decorated with Christian um, uh, like artwork and things like that. Not the same as the ones made from the livestock horns in pagan times. So that's all I'll speak about um, regarding the archaeology. Um, now on to the actual written sources of drinking horns. So we'll go over the mythological and legendary sources first. Uh, namely, mostly from the uh, Poetic and Prose Edda. In the Prose Edda poem, Skaldskapamal, most of you know this, the tale of Odin and the Mead of Poetry, where he snuck into the giant Suhtungir's uh, mountain hall, and he stole the magic Mead of Poetry, and with this he became all wise. Um, a horn is not specifically mentioned here, but I bring this up because the Mead of Poetry was made with honey, and the blood of Kvasir, the wisest of all men that was killed by the dwarves. And I think this reflects a, a very a real ritual that humans did, mixing blood with honey for this ritual drink. Um, see my video I did about blood, and I'll speak about that uh, towards the end of the video too. Next source comes in Grimnismal. Here Odin uh, speaks about um, Valhalla, and he describes um, in many ways what it is like. And this part, he tells how the Valkyries will bear him and all the Einheiriad uh, drinking horns when they are in the afterlife. And here are the names of some different Valkyries that would be uh, bringing the drinking horns full of um, mead or ale or whatever. Next source in the Swift Dogs Mall. Speaking of afterlives, here the words horn and also uh, ruth uh, refer to names of rivers in hell. Okay, otherwise not attested anywhere else. I'm not sure if there's a connection to drinking horns there, but I thought I'd include that uh, anyway. Another one is in Lukasena, the poem, uh, where another maiden, Siv, Thor's wife, comes and serves the mead to the guest Loki as he comes in the hall. Another example of the maiden serving a uh, drinking horn. Another one comes in a tale called Sörlathattir, where the goddess Freya is uh, dressed as a common woman who is uh, offering a drinking horn to a man named Heidin, and uh, he basically, um, it's a drink of forgetfulness, and it, you know, makes him lose his memory, and it launches the conflicts and the wars that come from the next uh, 150 years or so in that tale. So it's a different purpose, it's not uh, a positive <laughs> one like the other attestations, it's used as a curse type of thing but either way it's a woman serving the drinking horn there another one is in the Vulusbo 
Uh, you all know the um, uh, Yallarhorn, uh, Heimdall's horn that he blows that uh, signals uh, the coming of Hrangnarok. So that's true, it is a blowing horn, um, but it's not, not attested here. Here it's attested as something pouring, denoting that it could also be used as a vessel for liquid. Another one, a famous story that you have all heard of probably, comes in the prose at a Gilfagindinge section. Uh, Thor takes a trip to Utgardaloki. Um, and their competitions of trickery. Uh, one of the competitions, Thor says he is the best drinker, and the giants give him a horn um, to drink up. If you're such a good drinker, let's just drink up this horn. And with all his might, Thor is able to drink, 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 and, and he only drains just a tiny little bit, a couple sips. It turns out that the bottom of the horn was magically connected to the sea. And they were scared because the sea level had dropped and it had frightened everyone. Thor was able to drink this much. And this is the inspiration for this drinking horn that I created here with the ocean on the inside that you can find on my shop. Um, next we can speak about the legendary sources. These are definitely not... 100% real, uh, but they are definitely based on real humans and events that happened in the kind of Vendel era migration period time. Uh, Sigurd Rifumal, right as the hero Sigurd wakes up Brunhildr in stanza 1 and 2, she gives him a horn um, immediately when she wakes up and a drink of mead called Memory uh, Drought. Um, and then in stanza 7, uh, she mentions that uh, she can teach him how to use uh, ale runes. She would carve runes on a horn um, to avoid being poisoned by a treacherous maiden. And those are called uh, ale runes. Uh, another uh, poem, Gudrun Akvida, um, in stanza 22. Uh, here she describes the carvings on a drinking horn as Veskin's um, uh, Stafit. Um, so all manner of letters were carved on the uh, drinking horn. We don't know exactly which ones, but I'm sure it would have been at least the parts or the full uh, futhark. Another one in uh, Verdusunga Saga. And here it's uh, Gudrun's mother, uh, Grimhildr, who offers a drinking horn to welcome the hero Sigurd at the royal court. Um, again, this is a horn of forgetfulness that she is serving. Um, so with this, um, Sigurd forgets his uh, kind of engagement to Brynhildr, and he ends up marrying um, the princess Gudrun, and with that begins the downfall and all these spiraling events that destroy the Völsung uh, clan and all the bad events that are about to come in the rest of the story. Final legendary source, um, Beowulf, an old English poem about um, their origins in uh, Denmark. Um, the hero Beowulf arrives at the hall of the Danish king Hrothgar uh, to help him defeat the monster Grendel, and it is the task of Hrothgar's wife, uh, Wiltho, um, to welcome uh, Beowulf and his men into the hall by giving him a drink in kind of a grand spectacle, actually. Uh, she strengthens the relationship between Beowulf and Hrothgar and basically secures peace in the hall and trust on all parts. So the joint drinking uh, served by the king's wife kind of uh, serves as like an insurance and security and it guarantees uh, both parties like um, you know trust in each other brotherhood you know welcoming a guest equality in a sense things like that so as you can see um, the mythological and legendary sources most often it's a woman uh, serving the drinks uh, for whatever the purpose may be um, now before you get all pissed off ladies I'm gonna get onto the real sources soon but before you get all pissed off feminism girl power yeah down with the patriarchy la 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 okay I don't want anyone thinking of this as like an oppressive uh, thing like ah oh, winch bring me my beer <laughs> beer maiden <laughs> this is chop chop <laughs> no bringing a drinking horn to an honored guest or a friend visiting was a great honor and only the highest class of women would have with the best status would have the honor to be serving um, the honored guests or friends 
They didn't just have some slave girl do it. They could have easily done this. It was a privilege for the most honorable women. Like, she had control of the hall. She had control of the drinks. It was her realm. It was her um, gift to give. It was her responsibility to deal out the drink to all those who deserved it. And no more than they deserved, okay? It was the woman's job to kind of ensure no one got too drunk and everybody was satisfied and, and you know, being taken care of. And the men would have, in turn, been very respectful. I mean, they see their queen offering them a drink. Like, like that's not like a thing like, oh, check her ass, you know, grab her ass, bring me another beer woman like it's Hooters. No, the king uh, or the lord of the hall would have never allowed his wife to be treated disrespectfully like that as a basic ass servant, okay? And you guys got to understand, old Germanic tradition being a good host was one of the top ways that you could gain honor and harming you. Our selfish asses in the modern day have a hard time understanding this concept, um, uh, but there are countless sources from the time, all Germanic cultures uh, before Christianity came in, uh, where being a good host was tied to spirituality, it was tied to ethics, it was tied to honor. So men could achieve uh, the highest honor in different ways, mostly through uh, battle and bravery and oaths and things like that. Those were not necessarily options for women. So the number one way that women could achieve good hamanya, good honor, good karma, whatever you want to call it, it would have been to be a good host, to welcome people and make sure they are well taken care of. And if you find yourself getting offended by that, that just goes to show the brainwashing of the modern age. There is nothing wrong with being a good host. If you look at all of your grandmothers and any generation of women before then, before about uh, one or two generations ago, women took the utmost pride in being a good host and that that actually brought them pride and happiness and honor so this is human nature it's not just some ancient patriarchal aspect of the past that's all i wanted to say about that um so people won't get offended and they can you know <laughs> admire uh, our old culture but uh on to the real historical sources now now these are the ones in the sources that are generally believed to be uh, real humans and events. First, we can talk about some law codes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the good old Catholic Church came along and made drinking horns illegal. Something called the Synod of Chelsea in the year 787, which was kind of like a reformation of laws in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, not that long after they became uh, Christian, actually. Um, drinking horns were considered to be sinful objects and use of them uh, was forbidden. We have another law code, or two law codes actually from Sweden, dated to the 11 and 1200s, called Dalalogen and Smålandslagen. Um, uh, two law codes uh, from the very places that paganism actually lasted the longest, and they prohibit the use of hair, nail clippings, and horns. And they were dismissed as like pagan sinful items that were not allowed to be used. Interestingly enough, all these things, um, horn, uh, hair, and nails, they're made of the same thing, basically, the keratin type uh, protein. Okay, so you, a lot of you know the long history of uh, uh, use of nail clippings and hair in magic uh, ritual, but horns were right there in the same category. Uh, of course, they can't outlaw horns or hair or nail clippings. We all have these. Cows have horns. Just like certain plants grow in nature. You can't outlaw the plants. They're going to grow anyway. But what the church did was they made it illegal to use these items. Uh, so those are just three laws that I'm aware of that we still have, like, preserved, that we know existed. But the same thing probably happened everywhere um, in Germanic Europe, okay? So just be aware. Um, uh, the sources that I'm about to go over are documenting the Viking Age, um, and horns would have been very much a part of the Viking culture of the time, but illegal um, in the rest of the Germanic world uh, at the time. It, uh, not used, at least not out in the open. But they would have been uh, a few hundred years before, when all the other uh, Germanic cultures were still pagan. So, on to the sagas and other tales. Um, there are way too many mentions of drinking horns, uh, all littered throughout the saga, so we can't go over them all, or else we'll be here all day, but I'm going to go over the most famous and meaningful attestations that we can learn some interesting things from. Uh, in a few tales, 
uh, that I'm all, all going to list up here. They're they're basically the same tale, but they're told in slightly different versions. Uh, the horns are called Vitningai, uh, and in here two horns are brought to the king Olav Tryggvason. Uh, the king who uh, really was the first one to bring Christianity into the uh, uh, widespread use in Norway. Two horns were brought to him by Helgi, and uh, two pagan Finns that were accompanying him that were good with magic. Olav took the horns, but he had a bishop bless them, and he offered uh, a drink uh, to the strangers visiting um, with with those horns that were just blessed, but they poured it out in disgust, stormed out of the hall, and the story stated that uh, the new horns were better than the old horns um, that Ulav had had already in possession. Of course, that's with a Christian bias. Of course, it was a tale written by Christians about a Christian king, um, but it definitely shows that horns were in nature pagan originally but they could be blessed by a bishop and do whatever they needed to do and it rendered them like uh, accessible you know, or like acceptable to be used in a christian context even though they were in, uh, inherently a pagan thing and another um harald uh, fairhair saga horns are mentioned quite a few times it usually describes them as golden either the, the whole horn was golden material or just the fittings you know the stands or the rims or the terminals and stuff like that they would have been golden and again we see this in the archaeological finds in the early viking age um and before like at the time of uh, Harald Fairhair and, and before that time we find more horns in the archaeology made out of precious metals but in the uh, mid to late Viking Age, it was more actual livestock horn that was used. Uh, another um, saga, um, Harald Fairhair's son, uh, Håkon the Good Saga, um, a better description of a ritual use of horns comes in here. At a major sacrifice, uh, the Norwegians were toasting to Odin, and the king, uh, Håkon, didn't want to drink from the horns because he was a uh, Christian. Uh, he was obliged to take part in the ceremony just to like because he was the king and it was all all pagan people uh, there um, So he had to take part in the ceremony anyway, so he drank out of it But he made the sign of a cross first over the horn um, Which kind of offended the pagans so the uh, uh, pagan named the uh, Korda came and made the sign of the hammer We don't know exactly what that is, but he made the sign of a uh, Thor's hammer uh, whatever that um, may be so d definitely a notion of drinking horns associated with pagan ritual here and forbidden by Christianity and in this particular situation um, it was at the, a feast after the Yule uh, sacrifice um, and just the fact that the Christian Håkon didn't even want to have a sip from the horn uh, even though he was the only Christian there in a country full of pagans at the time it shows that either the horn was considered to be very very pagan or what was in the horn the drink inside there was considered to be very very pagan in my opinion it would have been some sort of drink made with not only alcohol but sacrificial blood too and I'll explain why uh, at the end of the video uh, there and another tale called uh, Trollatattir um, it's a version of the telling of Olaf uh, Tryggvason's life um, and one part of it um, there is a story of Olaf's journey uh, north sailing up the coast uh, which was inhabited by trolls and giants, aka the Finns, you know, the wizards, magic practitioners that um, inhabited the Logaland and uh, Finnmark. They set up camp for the night, and Olaf sends a couple of his men out to scout the area, and they find a cave inhabited by three trolls. Uh, one of them uh, told the story of how he changed his gender. Uh, to a woman once and he came to the king's court and he offered a drinking horn filled with poison mead to the king but the king throws it back in the troll's face so again it's a woman serving a drink uh, this time as a guest um, but it was used as a curse type thing or poison as mentioned in a couple other sources uh, another one in Sturlaug's saga one of the main uh, quests of the tale that Sturlaug had to complete was to unite the separated drinking horn pair by reclaiming one of the horns from a temple that was dedicated to Odin and Thor. 
Stulauk uh, succeeds in this dangerous mission, uniting the horns. Um, and again, this is agreeing with the archaeological finds that horns were meant to come in pairs. And here they had a direct link, actually, to a temple of Odin and Thor. So here, um, in this story also, the material of the horns was mentioned. And they were made of Aurochs horn, an animal that was never um, native to Iceland, where this saga takes place. And the animal had been extinct in many parts of Europe um, by the time. So it was uh, either a very, very old drinking horn they were talking about, um, or it was something that would have been imported from the east of Europe, where the Oroch species were surviving uh, much longer. Another one in the Egil Saga, the famous example of rune magic uh, a lot of you may be heard of. Uh, Egil is at a feast where him and his men uh, weren't uh, exactly welcome <laughs> to the feast uh, by the chieftain of the hall there. So the wife of the chieftain keeps bringing Egil drinks that are poisoned. Egil carves runes in the drinking horn, reddens them with his blood, and then he is immune from harm uh, of the poison. And I've got a few styles. These are a couple of them inspired by the runes that were carved um, in this story uh, that I carry on the shop. But uh, again, it's a woman serving the drinks. But you had to be careful because there are, you know, plenty of sources of the you know, uh, woman poisoning the drinks as well. So in a way, a uh, woman bringing the uh, drinking horn was to kind of ensure trust from both sides. You trusted the woman that it wasn't going to be uh, poisoned. Note also that um, women serving the drink was not just a Scandinavian thing, but a total Germanic thing. Um, in a tale from Anglo-Saxon England uh, from the 1300s called King Horn, uh, but we think it's a, it was a whole lot older than this. We think it's an Anglo-Norman uh, tale, dated back to pagan times actually. At her bridal feast, the king's daughter carries a ceremonial drinking horn around to the guests, but when she is approached by a man... Um, who is a beggar, she offers him a drink from a bowl instead, um, because that was more fitting for him. Uh, so yes, the woman of the highest class had the duty and privilege of passing out the drinking horns to the guests, but only to the most honorable uh, men. You couldn't be some peasant or bum or beggar and expect to get a drink from the lady of the hall. Uh, another old English poem uh, called Maxims uh, uh, One, which is an Anglo-Saxon poem dated to Christian times, but many parts of it have much older pagan origin. As you can see here, you know, it shows that it was an honor and privilege to deal out the drinks from the horn. And we think that this whole aspect uh, stems back to the uh, uh, earliest Germanic cultures and the Germanic tribes and what Tacitus called Comitatus, uh, like the band of warriors that would have had the utmost loyalty to their lord and leader, and their leader to them too. And this was called, uh, uh, all kind of solidified with uh, taking oaths um, and regular communal drinking altogether. Uh, so that's all the sources I'll go over for this video. It's already long enough. But um, on to uh, the spiritual uh, yeah, points that I'd like to bring up. I'll maybe go in a bit more depth in a Patreon video about these. Because the video is long already and I want to keep it kind of uh, source based at least. But I'll give a few uh, quick interesting points. Um, remember when I said drinking horns could be referred to as a uh, Hörger Bruna. The uh, 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 Hörger of the eyebrows of a bull. So the, uh, the Hörger was the uh, Norse pagan altar. And it would of course be where the sacrifices were left. It was a pile of stones usually. And they would also be reddened with blood and sacrifices. Numerous sources for that. The blood and the meat of the uh, sacrificed animal was left on the Hörgir. Because that's what the gods or the Dísir or the spirits or elves or ancestral spirits. Uh, that's where they would come and take the offering and consume the blood. Elves especially were uh, known to enjoy blood. The Hörgir for us humans... 
uh, is the horn. The horn is our Hörige, just as the spirits um, drink the offering from the uh, Hörige, the pile of stones, we drink our offering to us from the horn here. This is another reason why I'm certain they made some sort of um, alcoholic drink added with the blood of a sacrificed animal. We know this kind of thing was done. See my video that I did on blood, and this is also why it would have been considered a very forbidden thing in the Christian belief. It's because our spirits, along with the gods and the elves and the Desir and any other ancestral um, uh, or spiritual uh, being, um, get certain benefits and effects from drinking blood. So for us humans, the most effective way to drink the blood would be out of a drinking horn. Another point, um, just about um, uh, horns, uh, as I did a video on, um, Viking helmets actually did have horns. They weren't helmets used in battle, um, but helmets used in spiritual ritual. Uh, the purpose was to function as kind of like an antenna above the head. The horn was an antenna bringing in the powers, bringing in the spirits or the energy to do whatever purpose of the ritual that it was going to be. Uh, these animals like the bull or a goat or elk or deer or aurochs, whatever, they all have horns. They all have these antennas on their heads at all times. So it's easy to see why humans chose these things for their religious uh, rituals to drink from. The very part of the animal that functions as an antenna we can actually take that and drink from it. So whatever spiritual uh, drink that may be. But they could also use it for other magical and uh, spiritual practices, just like they did hair and nails. Um, one thing that you all know um, they, that they use these things for was voodoo dolls or to curse others with the hair or nail clippings. But there are many more practices all around the world involving hair, antlers, nails, and horns. Also, if you notice, um, all these things, hair, nails, horns, they still grow on a person uh, after death, even quite some time after death. Um, they're still growing. Um, so these things are thought to have a certain aspect of life force that is independent uh, of the person or animal that is attached to, actually. Um, so that's a very interesting point of just about the material of these things. Finally, speaking about all these um, real and mythological attestations of the females serving drinks. So we know they did this in feast settings or during a festival or while uh, hosting guests. But there is a big belief um, among scholars that um, the female figures also served drinks like this from horns in a ritual setting. All kinds of possible, you know, um, ritual settings like initiations, initiations into adulthood, warrior bands or rituals, um, initiations into cults or classes of people or, or groups of people, you know, giving psychoactive substances to, to get altered states of consciousness similar to these like ayahuasca rituals that we see, uh, the Vedic Soma drink or the Greek Ambrosia drink all over the world. World, and especially the Indo-European culture, we have uh, attestations of um, uh, real, uh, like ritual, psychoactive drinks that they used. Um, see again, Maria Kriedhaug's um, book uh, for a lot more info on that. It's a really a great read. Uh, we know this was done in the Norse and all the Indo-European world, even though we don't know the actual details. They are not preserved from the Norse sources, at least. It's my belief, though, um, to add one more thing. You're not going to read this anywhere else. These are just my thoughts. But it's my belief that uh, serving the drinking horns is a big part of the female afterlife and its function. So, of course, the Norse beliefs are centered around head and, um, of course, and then uh, reincarnation, where most of us go. But uh, for the most honorable men that ascend spiritually, they can break that reincarnation cycle and they go to Valhalla. Is it only men there? Um, from the sources, yeah, you know, only the men who die from uh, weapons can go to Valhalla. That's kind of gay, who would want to go there and spend eternity if it was all men? But there are women there, don't forget. So we don't have sources that living women could go to Valhalla. 
but uh, there are Valkyries and Decid in Valhalla, okay? So, real uh, human women, only the most honorable and spiritually deserving, only those women um, can die and undergo the transformation to become a Decid or even a Valkyrie. Uh, where one of the many functions that they have is to bring drinks and welcome the men into hall just as the most honorable women did in real life. And again, that's just one of the functions of, of females in the afterlife and in Valhalla. Those are just my thoughts though. Um, what are the other functions of them in afterlife? What is Valhalla? What do we have to do to get there? Long subjects for another video, but I hope that helps. There is at least um, some light shed on drinking horns. That was a long video, and you can see what an important spiritual tool they were in the Norse and Germanic beliefs. But that's all for today. Thank you for watching the whole thing. Vi ses nästa gång.